unserem Weg zu der Stadt, wo ich einstmals gelebt. Wolke sei doch lieb zu mir und bring meine Botschaft mit dir. This is again a picture of my family. This is the trio, the Brüder Knoller, yeah. where we play music. Here is a program uh, where, on, in 1932, am Bayerischen Hof in Vienna. But uh, as far as I was concerned, I was a happy little lad. After all, with 10 years of age, you don't need very much to make you happy. I had my friends, I had my football, I had the park. As a teenager, you know, you had to know the latest hits in school. You had to show off with what you, with the songs that you knew. And then I learned to play the piano. And so I, I was quite lucky in, at parties. We had this big house in the, a 14 room house. Zimmer, Küche, Cabinet. That means a room, a kitchen without water, by the way. And cabinet, a box room. That's where my sister and I slept. The toilet outside in the gangway. Now, a family which was a middle class Jewish family in Vienna. My father was a, a buchhalter, a bookkeeper, um, working for a textile uh, firm. We lived in number 15, they lived in number 13. The two women used to cook together. It was cheaper that way that we were Jews and they were Catholics, that didn't come up. Every Wednesday afternoon, I went on a steamer on the Dona Canal in Dona, and I thought it was for my benefit, but the captain of that ship was Olga's boyfriend. We were very religious, but I would say that it was simply because that's, that was the family. We were very assimilated. I mean, we did keep some of the festivals, but I scarcely knew I was Jewish until the Nazis came. My father is in the Stadtzentrum of Wien geboren. Man könnte nicht zentraler sein, nämlich Stephansplatz Nummer 9. Meine Mutter war ausgezeichnet sprachbegabt und konnte, ich glaube, acht Sprachen lesen. Mein Vater war hochmusikalisch, war ein guter Geiger, der sich selbst das Klavierlernen, Klavierspielen beigebracht hat. Life was really wonderful in Vienna. I liked music, I liked melodies in particular. I started writing my own as a, as a teenager, yes. I would have done very well if it hadn't been for Hitler. Since the beginning of the morning, that loudspeaker was blaring away martial music. And every now and again, the announcer would come to the microphone, stand by for important announcements. You know, we children were completely ignored. And we realized there was something going on which we couldn't understand. My parents asked me to listen on the evening of the 11th of March, 1938. And the announcer came to the microphone to say that Dr. Kurz von Schuschnigg, the Chancellor of the Republic, had just entered the studio. And it was a terrible a speech, you know, from my parents, I remember that. And everybody was quiet. When I say everybody, a lot of our neighbours had come to our little uh, apartment because of the loudspeaker. They all wanted to hear. I was at school, uh, there was a holiday when Hitler marched into Austria and things were not quite the same ever since. Well, nobody really knew what was going on in the world. What with Herr Hitler arriving, <laughs> everything changed, yes. Österreich ist ein Teil des Deutschen Reiches geworden. Der Reichskanzler, unser Führer, ist Adolf Hitler. 
that's been very angrily crossed out. He kept believing to the last moment it wouldn't happen. The harassment against the Jews started immediately. And as we walked, the very same people who were our friends, who were in our flat to listen to the announcement, now not only ignored us, but shouted after us. How can this be? This is only a few hours ago they were our friends. They're calling you do Zau Yud or something. You know, but these were little things which didn't affect our life. But I tell you what did affect me. When I wanted to go into the Ataba Park, it's still there. And I saw the notice, Juden verboten, no Jews allowed. That affected me. I was in the Augarten and um, I came close to being beaten up, but wasn't because suddenly came one of Claire's then boyfriends. He was accompanied by two or three other um, friends of the same age and size and um, I sort of turned towards them and the 50 odd boys disappeared rapidly into the bushes, as we did indeed. It was this man, 20 years friendship, 1918 to 38, that's 20 years, who led this group of thugs Jude, that's where the Jew lies. Because my father was in bed because he was ill. And they dragged him out. My father wanted not to immigrate. He said he was too old, he couldn't go back. There was nothing to happen. The great powers had us guaranteed. I was old enough, even at 10, to understand the wickedness of how how can this be? This is my Uncle Kurt. He was the man who took me to a football match. When the Nazis came overnight, uh, they commandeered my father's surgery. Um, the Gestapo man came in and said, take your positions and go. They only were allowed to take 10 rice mark in their pocket and only one suitcase with clothes. The uh, Night, the crystal night, we saw all the synagogues burning, you know, the second, second district, there were quite a few synagogues and we could see the smoke rising from all of them. And uh, it was uh, horrific. They smashed in the window and uh, took whatever they wanted, but the police didn't interfere. My father called the family together and said, look here, you can't just go and live. Uh, in a country where these things can happen. You boys, you are young. For us old ones it's okay because we are old, nothing will happen to us. Very early in the morning, uh, Gestapo came up the stairs of the block of flats and knocked on all the doors and got in, smashed everything up and whatever. But luckily they couldn't get into our flat Firstly, because we kept so quiet, it seemed as though it was unoccupied. Klopft. Warum klopft es in der Nacht? Ich weiß schon, wer es ist. Darum nicht aufgemacht. Ich habe Angst. Meine Mutter steht auf aus dem Bett. Bis hin zur Türe geht sie wie ein Blinde. Sie will den Vater schützen. Aus Türholz wird gehaut. Drei Mann mit Mützen, der Schimpfer wegen auf den Nasenrücken, stürmen herein. Ich will mich bücken, um nicht gesehen zu sein. Da höre ich meine Mutter schreien. Ich fasse den einen Mann am Bein. Seither habe ich die Schramme im Gesicht. In the morning, I was woken up very early and told we're going on holiday. Which of course I was, you know, delighted by that. Particularly when I was told we're going to Paris. Yeah, going abroad. One day she came home and kissed me and, and cuddled me and goodness knows what. And, and I didn't like that. <laughs> I, I, ten years I was quite a man. Otto, you're going to England. And I said, what can I take with me? And my parents said, no, don't worry, you'll be back, you know, soon. We can only take two small cases. 
So I took one, one bear, which I could carry under my arm. England. Gosh, I was so excited. And when are we going? No, Otto. Not we, but you. And the other relations had no phones. They were never able to say goodbye. And so they took us to the Westbahnhof. Over the loudspeaker system, it was announced that there were to be no signs of emotion. That meant no tears. How can you, how can you uh, prohibit a child not to cry knowing that he might never see his parents again? At the very beginning, it was very hard for me to leave my parents. Uh, fear in one hand, on the other hand, wow, I'll be able to do whatever I want, father, uh, 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 nobody to tell me what to do. You know, it was a, a mixed emotion. And I remember daily, waving a handkerchief. <laughs> I remember her white shoes, because I used to tease her about that with her high heels. I can, I can hear her. Otto sei schön brav, wir sehen uns bald wieder. Be a good boy, we'll see each other again shortly. Uh, my father took me to the uh, Belgium border, hired a guy to take me into, Hol into Belgium. I went to Antwerp. And I went to the English British consul, I went to the French consul, I went to the American consul, I went to the Scandinavian consul, and everybody put the door in my face when I showed them our passport with the big red J, which indicated that we were Jewish. I went to the French border, the French gendarme um, asked me for papers and I showed my passport, my German passport, which had a big red J uh, in front of that passport. They arrested me then in Lille immediately as an enemy alien. I went with our three passports. Uh, to the Albanian consul, and to my greatest and pleasant surprise when I knocked at the door, there I was, facing the Albanian consul. He put our visas in, and he wished me as a good stay in his country. We were deported when I was about three, three and a half. My mother heard of the kinder transport, the scheme where the British government agreed to take 10,000 refugee children from Central Europe. They chose a number of children to go on this boat to London because the kinder transport had started. We were going on the kinder transport. Uh, we were ready to go. I think there must have been a taxi to take us to the, uh, to the railway station. And it was evening. And as we were putting suitcases into the car, uh, there were two young girls passing us, and one of them said, glückliche Leute, because I think the implication was, yes, we were getting out, and they were not, they were staying in. We were put to the station, and there were lots of children there. I didn't know, none of the children knew quite was, what was ahead of them. But we were just put in a train and saying goodbye to our parents. But how do you get from Albania to London? Not so easy, particularly before the war. So by train, you'd have to travel through different countries. And with a passport, with a red J, nobody would let you through. At our destination, we arrived and um, uh, doors opened up, SS in uniform with dogs on their lead and whips in their hand. A loudspeaker came on. You are here in Auschwitz concentration camp. And we went through the gate where it says Arbeit macht frei. And it was Hook of Holland to Harwich, uh, an overnight passage. Uh, in March, we arrived at Bergen-Belsen, the last camp where there was no food whatsoever for the whole time until liberation, which was when the British troops entered uh, Bergen-Belsen. Well, he then came up with the proposition that I should fly with KLM, the Dutch airline that went from Milan, 
via Frankfurt and Cologne to then Rotterdam, Amsterdam, London. Well, that was a great risk to take via a German port. But that was the only possibility we had. Ich bin verarmt. Es blieb mir nichts. Versunken ist das Angesicht der frühen Zeit. Ein Land habe ich niemals gehabt. Der Boden hat mich nie gelabt. Doch Klang und Laut und Mutterworte labten mich. Die Seuche kam und raffte vor die Singenden. Nun Mutterwort und Laut und Klang, mein Land, mein Land, versunken. The next port. When we got into the transit lounge, they announced our name. So we reported, and the following two and a half hours were the worst in my life, which I won't describe. But we got through. We were finally being bashed about, bleeding, limping. We could walk back to, and the, the steward and the pilot had not allowed that plane to take off without their full contingent of passengers. So we really owe our life to him, to them. And my other brother, who was then 10, Ossi, uh, he and I arrived in London on the 29th of August, 39, very late, two or three days before the war. The reason the kinder transport was able to function was because here in London, in the Houses of Parliament, there was an all-night sitting. The British government had a debate in Parliament and decided that um, they would allow 10,000 children up to the age of 17 without their parents, unaccompanied, on a temporary basis into the United Kingdom without a passport. And we're so grateful. 10,000 children got went to England, but one and a half million died in the concentration camp. And outside Liverpool Street, by the way, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a sculpture designated to remind people that that was the first part of England that we saw. And in the morning, it wasn't the White Cliffs of Dover that I saw. It was the Essex coast. Already a little homesick. I heard people speak a language which I thought, for goodness sake, how can they understand each other speaking a language like that? We were met at the other side by um, a friend of the people that we would be staying with. We all had a little label when I think of it. And we were waiting for people to choose us for temporary. It was always impressed upon it's a temporary thing. You come in from Zug in, the Liverpool, in Liverpool Street station and come in so a Sporthalle. Um, and we had jeder a um, luggage label uh, on, uh, on us, where our name was on. I was taken in, first of all, by a wonderful Christian family in the northeast of England. They took us in because of their Christian principles. We had man had these names ausgerufen and jemand had these Kinder abgeholt. Am Ende blieben einige, vielleicht nur drei übrig. Ich wurde nicht abgeholt, weil ich niemanden hatte, der mich abholen sollte. Uh, we landed, I suppose, in what you might call the lap of luxury, unlike many other people who did not. We had a very interesting time with this dear actress, who was very young, Constance Cummings, she's well known, and she was wonderful. She took us to different places, she was a bit around London, and even further. And from then on, uh, by various bits of stroke of luck, we survived the war. Doodlebugs came very close. We had quite a lot of narrow escapes. I got up one night when the raid was on to um, possibly to go to the loo or to look for something. When I came back to the bed, I found a very large 
sheet of glass covering it, which had blown in from a bomb which had landed nearby. Am nächsten Tag ähm, kam eine sehr elegante Dame in einem Op Open Tourer Rolls Royce und hat uns mitgenommen, um uns London zu zeigen. Ich ähm, äh, weiß jetzt, dass das, äh, es war Lady Wally Cohen. The chairman of the Dorking Refugee Committee, he was Ralph Vaughan Williams, the composer. He helped a lot of Jewish and non-Jewish musicians to get out of Central Europe before the war started. As it happens, the one time he came at the end, the, they said to him, look, we've got a dozen children. We've got nothing to do with them. So he said, don't worry, I'll take them to the refugee home in Dorking. I was then uh, interned, was first uh, in Liverpool, then uh, in Heighton, then on the Isle of Man, but only a short time. Und man sagte uns, dass man uns nach Übersee äh, bringen wird. Her father was a high court judge and the family was very much uh, traditionally traditional. When I arrived at the home and we had dinner, I was served together with the father and the daughter on a fully laid table. Uh, three knives on one side, two forks on the other, a fork and, an, and a spoon in front, three glasses in front of me, the servant addressed me as Master Carl. Somehow all the others had family or found family. I was left on my own. All the families there <coughs> were Jewish, except one. They took me, they fostered me. Then it was Kreibig. So I always knew they weren't my parents, but as far as I was concerned, they really looked after me very well. Ich war auf der bekannten Daniela und war, wir waren dort 56 Tage unterwegs nach Australien. Nur die Reise war problematisch in vieler Hinsicht, dadurch, dass die Bewachung waren meistens demoralisierte Soldaten von, die, von Dunkirk. Sie haben uns behandelt wie, wie Kriegsgefangene. There was a school in Hove, near Brighton, a Jewish school, where they actually had a class for foreigners. And there I learned English. But I also learned English quite a lot from reading comics, which I enjoyed. Die Australier hatten uns uns selbst überlassen zu einem sehr großen Teil und wir konnten äh, das ganze Lager organisieren. My mother as a domestic, so that she could serve in a household, and I as an apprentice to a Jewish hairdresser in the East End of London. Spät 1942 war auch eine weitere Möglichkeit, nach England zurückzukommen, wenn man sich bereit erklärte, auf der Landwirtschaft zu arbeiten. While I was still in Hove, I started feeling, you know, like an ordinary schoolboy. Just part of a normal English, you know, teenager. I couldn't speak a word of English. Coinage, or the money situation in, in, in London drove me crazy. Quite apart from measurements and weights. Well, there were a lot of trolley buses and trams at that time. Yes, there were trams. I was playing outside one day on my scooter, pretending I was a bus driver, and a young man with a bicycle came, he was about 17 at the time, and said, where do Mr. and Mrs. Kreibich live? I said, oh, I'll show you. I showed him up, went down, continued playing. The next thing, my foster mother, Emily, she came down and said, you know, that was, that's your brother. Now, up until then, I'd been going to church, I'd been going to Sunday school, they brought me up as their son. From that particular moment, no more church, no more Sunday school. It seemed to me best 
to try for a science career because in science we are acknowledged as being international and there was least prejudice against outsiders. Anyway, the Jewish community weren't very happy that I was with the Christian family and I was only a, a foster mother now. And when I became old enough, I volunteered for the British Army. We went to England. My father-in-law had a um, was manufacturing a raincoat manufacturer. He was, so he opened up for us a shop in Burnt Oak in London, selling raincoats. And when I got to twenty-one, I actually had a choice of confirming my British nationality or becoming stateless. And confirming my British nationality meant that I had to join the army for two years. So I'd graduated, got a physics degree at London University and then I joined the army. We sold our business and I became a, I took on a job as a director of State of Israel bonds, where we fundraise for the Israel money. I entered my name for a, correspondent, for, a, for a teacher's training course after the war, which I eventually took. Mm -hmm. And it was the, the teaching diploma that got me into teaching. I had my life, my career, never planned. It was all zufall. But the fact that I came from the Board of Trade, to Paris, commanded to the Secretariat of Marshall Plans, nur eigentlich, weil ich äh, sprachen konnte. And as economist scientist, I ended up with a job at the National Research Development Corporation, which, which looked after government-sponsored inventions and tried to license these to industry. I started my career here, yes. First of all, working for London Transport, and the National Coal Board, it was all public bodies and then most of my career I worked for the Greater London Council mm -hmm. in scientific services. And we continued to finance research, we support research projects and we support access for the disabled, or for the less able I should say. I really flourished for the last 12 years of my working life because I loved talking to people, I loved giving lectures, I loved uh, uh, attending seminars. I was, a, uh, I think, a big fish in a fairly small pond. I wrote a lot of letters to newspapers, enthusing about data protection, which was not the most popular thing. And equally, uh, training people in data protection, not so much to even the facts, but making them realize that it was a worthwhile thing to do. Ja, ich war erfolgreich. Ich hatte genug. Ich hatte nie die Absicht, irgendwie, ich habe gesagt, es hat keinen Zweck, mehr zu haben, als man braucht. Und ähm, möglich nicht war, ein, ein Haus zu bauen. I was supervising not only the sales staff in England, but sales staff all over the world. We had reps in Denmark and Holland and France and Sweden and Poland. And I had to, uh, I had to supervise those. Es gibt Leute, die sich nicht an zwei verschiedene Milieus anpassen können. Das kann ich glücklicherweise. Ich bin wirklich in den Cotswolds Hills zu Hause. Aber ebenso bin ich am Stephansplatz zu Hause. Also so wie der gottselige Doppeladler symmetrisch ist, so bin ich ja symmetrisch. Ich habe beide Pässe. Und das ist typisch. Der Dichter im Exil, mir muss Vergessenes reichen, mit Verschollenem halte ich Haus, aus verdämmerndem glaube ich Scherben von Silben zu Wörtern heraus. Das sind noch gesegnete Tage, Scherben sind ähnliche Hort, wo hole ich, wenn die Verstummung kommt, Buchstaben für mein Wort. Ich bin zwar englischer Staatsbürger, unter anderem, ich bin auch österreichischer Staatsbürger, aber ich, nie, aber ich bin ein Wiener. Ich bin in Wien geboren und Wahlnach 
würde ich noch heute in Wien leben. You, you have in medicine, you have in art, you have in science, in all these areas, the, the children contributed to this country. Meine sehr lieben, da wir nun ernstlich an eine Umsiedlung denken müssen, muss man doch mit allen Eventualitäten rechnen. Und falls es Gottes Wille so wollte, dass wir uns nicht bald oder überhaupt nicht wiedersehen sollen, will ich euch alle meine Lieben und Teuren auf diesem Wege leben wohlfahren. One day, Mr. Ferguson showed me a letter from the International Red Cross. We regret to inform you that Herr, Frau and Fräulein Deutsch, Mr. Mrs. and Miss Deutsch, my parents and my sister, were taken from their last address to a destination out east. And we must assume that they perished in the Holocaust. And the tears came and came and came, and I thought it would never stop. Not so long ago, I stood in the very same place where I stood when I was a little boy. I knocked on the door of number 15, and the lady with a very poor German answered, she must have been Yugoslav, but I managed to explain to her that I lived there many, many years ago. Gosh, was that an experience for me. I stood in the very same flat. Yes, all different, but I stood there. I never wanted it to do it. At very first, the idea of going back, going to see the same Nazis. Two flats have been made into one. There's a bathroom now. It's all modern. The outside still looks the same. I couldn't stay there long. And I went to the park, the Ataba Park. That's still there. And I'll tell you what else is there. The tree where my mother used to sit by on a bench under the tree, shading from the sun, while I kicked the foot. I was mad in football, where I kicked the ball about. I was invited by the, by the Austrian government to go there. Naturally, my first thought is, I want to see where I lived. You know, it's the second time. I don't know, tears come easy to me. I couldn't stop myself. I had to make sure nobody saw me. I went to Untere Augartenstraße 32, went down on the third floor where we lived, and I rang the bell. And I was afraid that maybe an old Nazi, an old person like myself will open the door because maybe I will see furniture there that, that, my, that we had there. We, all our life we, we lived there. Mary and I went to Schlickplatz and went up to the flat. And it was a very moving occasion. In fact, we all cried, uh, including the people who live there now. And they gave us a very nice yowze. 
but it's a beautiful girl actually opened up, young girl opened up the, the door and she invited us in, gave us coffee and sacha torte and it, it was wonderful, we were wonderfully received. She changed every, everything was changed. There was no furniture there from our, uh, from our time, nothing at all to remind me. It's right in the corridor and I found my kinder zimmer, the nursery, which has now been partitioned. It's an office, the computer and Das erste Mal, wie ich in Wien war und meiner Frau zeigen wollte, wo wir in Wien zuletzt gelebt haben, gewohnt haben, ich stand auf der Straße in der Hahngasse unten und habe auf unsere Wohnung hinauf gezeigt. You know, nowadays I met so many wonderful people in Vienna and in, in Germany, you know, uh, I mean, who were not alive in that period. How can I hold, him, hold it against them? I can't. Auf der anderen Seite gegenüber war so ein kleiner Gemüseladen und die, die Frau war noch dieselbe Frau, die war dort und die hat gesehen, wir stehen dort und ich zeige dort hinauf und sie kam heraus und hat mich angeschaut und auf einmal haben wir, hat ihr Gesicht aufgeläutet und sie hat geglaubt, sie hat mich erkannt. Sie hat gesagt, wo waren es denn die ganzen Jahre? When I went, was stationed in Vienna with me, I did not try and look at the places where I had lived there before. Although by coincidence, I lived in the same district. We were, I worked yes. in the same district, but I did not go to look at my shop. I did not go. I don't know why. I just didn't. Uh, when you came to Vienna with me, that was the first time I went back to the shop. There we met the, the same man who'd bought it from my parents. We were invited by the Austrian government and since then I've been back at least twice also giving talks in schools. Jedes Mal, wenn ich wieder in Wien bin, gehe ich in die Schule und spreche zu den Kindern, weil sie daran interessiert sind, Zeitzeugen zu haben. When my old school invited me back for a plaque, it started a process by which I stopped just being a, a tourist in Vienna, which I had been until then. For 35 years I didn't talk about it. But to anybody, not even to my wife. And they, one Friday night dinner, they said to me, look, Dad, we know you have a number on your arm, you were in Auschwitz, why don't you tell us about it? They said, I don't want to talk about it. I didn't want to, I wanted to forget about everything. They said, but it isn't fair what you're doing. Walking along the Danube Canal, there was one heap of rubble after the other. The Diana Bart opposite, there were, where Strauss, where I knew that Strauss had played his Blue Danube for the first time. And all these Heaps, heap after heap were very huge. You know, the houses were very, in Vienna, very high. So it made sense. So on that evening, on Friday night, until four o'clock the, in the morning, I told all my story to my daughter and to my wife. And I got it out of myself. Because before that I had nightmares, dreams, uh, bad dreams. But as soon as I got it out of me, no more, no, no more nightmares, it was wonderful. And this is when I started actually talking about it. The, the thought went into my mind what, about what war was doing. They had been in the army for six, seven years, and I just took it as it came. But this stark difference from the last time I'd been walking along the Donaukanai to this time, the second day in Vienna, somehow hit my subconscious, or my conscious rather. There are still survivors nowadays who don't want to talk about this. They're, they're, and they are very old and miserable. And you know, I see them in the Holocaust Survivor Center. Mutter hören mich, ich habe überlebt. Dein Kind hat Satan überlebt. Sieh mich heute, wie ich die lange Treppe hinunterschreite, deinen letzten Gang. Ich setze meinen Fuß auf die Fliesen im Flur. 
in die Fährte deines Fußes, ich suche, suche deine Spur. Das Tor steht offen, du wirst offen stand zu deinem Tod. Wo Zeit in nichts vermag, wo Not, wir müssen ewig trauern. Now, with hindsight, many of these people claim that they cared for what was happening to the Jews in Austria, Germany, Poland and other German-occupied countries. But they didn't care. They didn't care in the least. Because if they had cared and would have opened their doors, not six million needed to have died in the gas chambers. Es ist traurig, was vielen mit dem Rest meiner Familie geschehen ist. Aber verbittert hat keinen Zweck. Denn in, in Wirklichkeit, ähm, in materiell, geht es mir besser und es ist mir zum größten Teil meines Lebens besser gegangen, als ich es je erwarten konnte. Not, it's not, they are not to blame. Uh, the great grandchildren or grandchildren. It's not their fault what happened at the Holocaust. And you've got to be very careful. Ich habe mich immer in Wien zu Hause gefühlt. Ich liebe nicht unbedingt alle Leute, die aus Wien kommen, aber ich liebe die Stadt. I'm often asked by English Jews, British Jews, how can you possibly go back to Austria? I've often thought about this. I sometimes sit here and listen. I've got a whole lot of Viennese music over there. Peter Alexander. And I can't help, I've still got this love for the culture. That the, you know, I was brought up in this uh, Viennese atmosphere. I still love Vienna. I still like to walk through these little narrow streets, which I know so well. They like to have a schnitzel. It is very important that the next generation, the present young and the next generation, realize that it is a moral responsibility for everyone to protect those who are being persecuted for no other reason than that they are following a different religion or are of a different race or ethnicity or different gender. Can you forgive and forget? Well, certainly I can't forget because if I had forgotten, I wouldn't be able to tell you all this. Can I forgive? Here I must say I've got no right to forgive. I've got no moral right to forgive because I wasn't the only one affected. Can I forgive on behalf of the six million of our people who perished, of my parents, my sister? We had, like in the year 1939, when my brother Willi was a student in London, with a very bescheiden income, und ich als Kindertransportkind komplett mittellos war, hat mir der Willi immer gesagt, also pass auf, man muss sparen. Aber auch mit einem kannst du in der Migration, darfst du nie sparen. Und das sind Briefmarken. Denn man muss Kontakte und Korrespondenz aufrechterhalten. I am the eternal optimist. Whenever I'm in trouble, so, oh, everything will be all right. It will come out okay, you know, this is my optimism. And I'm sure that this also helped me saving, save my life, I think. There is genocide ongoing right now in front of our noses, but the world hasn't learned. We still do not allow the asylum seekers to keep the asylum and be safe in a country where they will not be persecuted. I work so hard uh, uh, lecturing uh, like 54 schools last year uh, and and continuously uh, feeling i feel i have a mission 
that I have to tell the children about my story. So hopefully that the Holocaust will never ever forgotten. And this is my aim, this is my mission. Erstens kommt es anders, zweitens als man denkt. Was ich in einem langen Leben gelernt habe, ist, dass man nie voraussehen kann, dass, es, dass das Beste vorausplanen daneben gehen kann. It's like the old Greek saying, the Greek saying is call no man happy until he's dead. But you could equally say call no man unfortunate until he's dead. But how can I hate the youngsters with whom I speak in schools? They weren't born, they weren't alive, not even their parents. Their parents weren't alive. But when I see people of my age, these gemütliche Wiener, these very, very amiable people, what did you do? Where were you to? The only thing I really hate is when people of my generation say, Ja, wir haben davon nichts gewusst. We didn't know about it. That's hypocrisy. And I always tell these young people, it's your generation that must make sure that we have a much more righteous society, that you live in a world where nobody will be persecuted for no good reason. Apparent disasters can look absolutely disastrous, but the consequences, if you are very lucky and us, can be quite favorable. I always feel that the future holds something, but you've got to do something. You've got to be active. You've got to decide whatever it is you're doing. It doesn't, it doesn't always have to be um, for charitable events. It has to be for true, true things. You have to be honest. And money isn't the beginning and the end of everything. What is, is, is that you are true to yourself and that you are honest. Ich ging in meine Heimat, doch erkenne ich meine Heimat nicht. Sie hat sich so verändert, ich glaube, dass mir mein Herz zerbricht. Die Jugend aber denkt ganz neu und scheint die alten Werten treu. Es liegt in ihren jungen Händen, endlich den Rassenhass zu enden. Well, naturally, I want the world to know um, what can happen under a dictatorship. Um, so many atrocities happen nowadays still. It never happens in a democracy but always in under dictatorship or military junta. Democracy is a good thing for the world. Dictatorship is not. I think the message I like to pass on, that you cannot fight hate with hate. That hate only brings more hate. What may seem very difficult today, you can work at it and you can get over it. Bring sie der Donau, die Einstrahl so blau.